topic, uh, Darwin's uh, naturalistic explanation of moral guilt uh, will hit a more myopic group as this is not, you know, everybody's, uh, you know, forte uh, in listening to what Darwin has to say, but we'd love to hear who's on right now. Where are you from? Before we jump in, where do we got some of you from? I know that uh, it's still populating. So where are you listening from? Tim, do we have anybody or should we uh, just wait a few more minutes? Okay, I'm uh, communicating with the executive producer of One Minute Apologist. I'm trying to find out if we have anybody uh, engaged and listening right now. Um, and so he says that we do. Uh, Tim, uh, if you can, just in the private chat, give me a sense of if we should start going or if people are still populating the, the page. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> well, hey, I appreciate you guys uh, jumping aboard uh, to talk with me, um, interact with me about this idea of Darwin's explanation of moral guilt. Um, last week, I started off a series that I want to do as it relates to exploring uh, the phenomenon of guilt that we experience. And I distinguished between the fact of guilt and feelings of guilt and contested that one can feel guilty, but in fact, not be guilty. And that would be a pseudo type of guilt. But then there is one who could be guilty and not in fact feel guilty. And that would be kind of a deadening of the conscience over that particular moral action that was committed. What I've sought to do with my particular area of research on the moral argument is to develop a chain argument using a combination of abduction and deductive argumentation to develop an argument from guilt uh, for God's existence. And I begin my thesis off by exploring some naturalistic explanations of moral guilt. And the first person that I take on to look at his view of moral guilt is Charles Darwin. And so uh, today I just want to take some time to discuss uh, Darwin's view of moral guilt on naturalism. And when I'm done, I'd be happy just to kind of take some questions if you have any. I'm guessing this would probably be anywhere between 30 and 45 minutes where I'll talk and then uh, we'll be able to uh, do some Q and A. Uh, at the outset, uh, I'm going to deal with Darwin. Next week, I'm gonna talk about uh, Nietzsche's view of moral guilt, where I look in his second essay on the genealogy of morals, and then looking at Freud, uh, these three figures, I think, serve us, us a lot of helpful intel as it relates to what would influence much of naturalism today. And beginning with Darwin, we know that as it relates to his writings, uh, his big one, his magnum opus in 1859, on the origin of the species, he didn't have much to say as it relates to morality in that great work. Nevertheless, its influence uh, would have an insurmountable uh, reach as it relates to morality. He would reserve his words uh, for morality in his later writing, The Descent of Man, which is a massive uh, volume, but nevertheless, when it comes to Origin of the Species, which came out in 1859, uh, that particular piece, uh, it was uh, one of these very influential books that would transform the way that people thought about many things, right? Uh, and today you have naturalists of all stripes, uh, be it biologists, uh, 
um, psychologists, uh, neuroscientists, um, sociologists, primatologists, all these different types of uh, people who are naturalists within those fields. They've sought to construct moral theories upon the naturalistic foundation that Darwin built in his seminal work on the origin of the species. Uh, and as I mentioned, though little was said in it about morality, um, the ramifications, uh, the consequences, uh, certainly of natural selection and what we can see with evolution uh, would allow people to formulate their different uh, theories. Um, I would say that in 1871, when Descent of Man came out, about 11 years later, it's there where Darwin get, would give his explanation of the moral sense. So Darwin, uh, it's, a, it's a phrase that he used, the, the moral sense. And he sought uh, to give an explanation of the moral sense through the lens of natural history. So his view of moral guilt uh, derives from his naturalistic understanding of moral sense. And to show this, I'm going to do a few things in our time together. I want to clarify what Darwin meant by the moral sense. Um, I will explain what I mean by how he derives uh, moral guilt from the moral sense. I'll next share two or three naturalistic explanations of moral guilt as derived from the moral sense. And then I'll offer some closing assessment of Darwin's explanation of the moral sense, and in particular, moral guilt. Now, let me begin by conceding and acknowledging that Darwin does not explicitly use <clears throat> the word guilt in chapter four of Descent of Man, which is the key chapter where he talks about the moral sense. And um, don't let that discourage you from, from getting it, the, the idea of guilt, because the concept of moral guilt is easily recognized through his interchangeable use of such synonyms as regret, remorse, conscience, dissatisfaction, and even misery. So these were all terms that he uses synonymously. <clears throat> he didn't jump out at the beginning and give some sharp, definitive uh, language to the terminology that he's using, but it's not hard at all to recognize that what we mean by guilt, that is to, uh, you know, failing to do what one ought to do or breaking of some uh, moral law, uh, it, it, it's not hard to recognize that when he's using terms like regret or remorse or dissatisfaction or mercy that, uh, or excuse me, misery, that he's referring to the phenomenon of guilt. So let's talk about Darwin. Uh, and his moral sense as we dialogue, uh, or as I monologue, and then hopefully we can have a little dialogue. Uh, for Darwin, the moral sense is what sets us apart as humans from the rest of the animal world. In fact, in Descent of Man, on page 97, in his uh, 1874 uh, uh, rendition, we read him writing, I fully subscribe to the judgment of those writers who maintain that of all the differences between man and the lower animals, the moral sense or conscience is by far the most important. So here, um, Darwin summarizes the moral sense as a sense of uh, ought, as we can recognize. Um, he says this, excuse me, let me fix my... Phones. Don't you hate that when your phone, you, you say something and Siri interrupts the whole process on us and gives you a big beat down? Uh, let me read that quote again. I fully subscribe to the judgment of those writers who maintain that of all the differences between man and the lower animals, the moral sense or conscience is by far the most important. Okay. So Darwin, uh, he will later summarize the moral sense as a sense of ought. Uh, a sense that he considers humankind's uh, finest quality. Now, his intrigue with the moral sense beckons him to consider Immanuel Kant's great question, right? Whence they originate, right? Or, you know, where does this sense of ought 
uh, originate. Um, and it is this question on the origin of oughtness uh, as experienced by the moral sense that leads Darwin in pursuit of the answer from the vantage, vantage point of naturalism. So uh, Darwin states on page 80 of Descent of Man uh, regarding the moral sense of oughtness that as far as I know, no one has approached it exclusively from the side of natural history. So that's why I'm starting with Darwin uh, and looking at his moral sense and giving an account of it on naturalism. Now, many years later, uh, the acclaimed uh, naturalist E.O. Wilson uh, would write, uh, scientists and humanists should consider together the possibility that the time has come for ethics to be removed temporarily from the hands of the philosophers and biologized, um, biologicized. And so this biologicization, right? <laughs> this biologicization, so that's a mouthful. Let's all say it together, even though I can't hear you, right? This biologicization of ethics began with Darwin. He's the one who biologicizes ethics, right? Let's take a peek from natural history and more specifically, guilt. So how does Darwin derive moral guilt from the moral sense? Knowing that what I've said so far is he wants to take what he set out to do in Origin of the Species, 1859, and he wants to provide a naturalistic account for the moral sense. Well, how does he derive moral guilt from the moral sense? Well, think of the moral sense as sort of an umbrella term, arching over subordinate moral features, in particular shame, fear, altruism, guilt, of the various subordinate moral features, the concept of guilt is the main feature that Darwin utilizes to help his readers grasp his overarching theme of the moral sense. Okay, so following several pages of discussion, a uh, discussion about um, socially instinctive animals, Darwin uh, would state uh, as he circles back to his core research question which is, as you'll see, we have not, however, as yet considered the main point on which, from our present point of view, the whole question of the moral sense turns, right? Why should a man feel that he ought to obey one instinctive desire rather than another? Why is he bitterly regretful if he is yielded to a strong sense of self-preservation and has not risked his life to save that of a fellow creature? Or why does he regret having stolen food from Hungary? So the whole question by which the moral sense turns is kind of on this sense of oughtness, why we ought to obey, and then why is it that we have regret? Why is it that we have a sense of misery when we fail to do what we ought to do. So this derivation of guilt uh, from the moral sense is made even more ubiquitous or more obvious upon returning to his question a page or so later where Darwin queries uh, in the 1874 version and writes, why then does man regret? Even though trying to banish such regret, that he has followed the one natural impulse rather than the other. And why does he further feel that he ought to regret this conduct? So it's not only that Darwin is recognizing that we regret, but why is it that we recognize that we ought to regret? So man in this respect, he writes, differs profoundly <clears throat> from the lower animals. So Darwin, unlike um, Franz Duval, right, uh, the great, uh, you know, he, he, he writes a lot of great stuff on chimpanzees as he looks at them and, and, and writes some, uh, the primatologist who writes a lot of uh, interesting insights into, um, you know, animal emotions and their, and their behavior and some of the correspondence between us 
and, and the chimpanzees. Uh, what's interesting for Darwin is he saw that the, the clear distinguishing difference between us and animals was this moral sense, and in particular, our ability to feel guilt. Now, uh, Darwin gives us his explanation uh, for moral guilt, and he offers up a few reasons why he thinks it is that we as humans uh, have this status, and what is it about us that we contain this privilege role on naturalism, so to speak, whereby we are able to uh, operate as moral beings. And uh, he offers a few thoughts. He, he tells us that our reflective capacity causes us uh, to experience guilt. So answering the question, why is it that we feel and experience guilt? And why is it that we feel as though we ought to be guilty. It's because we have a reflective capacity that uh, the lower animals do not have. And so he spends a lot of time when he's talking about uh, his morals in the sense of, in the sense of man, first establishing how the animals do not have the moral sense. Now, that's not to say that he wouldn't recognize any uh, moral inkling whatsoever but a much superior uh, moral sense has evolved for humans. Now, to illustrate um, how our reflection can lead to regret, Darwin shares an example of a swallow. Um, he has his readers, he invites us sort of into a thought experiment where he has us imagine a female bird uh, with maternal instincts, forever forsaking uh, her maternal duties uh, once her young ones are out of sight. And uh, she succumbs. She succumbs to a more persistent migratory uh, instincts and just goes her way. Now, Darwin has us imagine, right? He then says, when arrived, right, the swallow, at the end of her long journey and the migratory instinct has ceased to act, what an agony of remorse the bird would feel. Now, he's using remorse here like guilt, right? The bird would feel from being endowed with great mental activity. She could not prevent the image constantly passing through her mind of her young ones perishing in the bleak north from cold and hunger. So absent of reflective capacity, what happens to the swallow? It migrates Sorrow-free, guiltless, no regret. But had the swallow had the capacity that we have as humans, reflective capacity, it would know that that it's, you know, young ones are starving to death. They're freezing to death. So here's a little critique of Darwin's reflective capacity. Well, it may be the case that reflection shows us why we do feel guilty, right? Like so we do something wrong. And so guilt is something that helps us to survive, right? It helps us to go ahead and remain um, fit to survive. We reflect and we realize through reflection that whenever I commit action A, I experience feelings uh, B, guilt. Therefore, I won't commit action A so that I won't experience the feelings of guilt anymore. And that, that reflective uh, process that we go through helps us to survive, so to speak, would be one way of looking at it. And while it might be the case that we can reflect, you know what, boy, um, every time I commit this action and I feel it, my guilt is kind of giving me a clue that if I keep that up, I'm going to limit uh, my well-being. I'm going to reduce uh, maximizing my life. Well, while it might be the case that reflection shows us why we feel guilty, it does not answer the question why we ought to feel guilty. A person may gather common sense through reflection, enabling him or her to make better decisions in the future, thereby via avoiding feeling guilty. 
But such reflection still does not explain why he or she ought to feel guilty to begin with. And so I, I think that that is a question that we have to ask ourselves. Why on the basis of evolutionary naturalism would a person be obligated to avoid some action A in the first place? Um, this leaves Darwin with another question to solve, and that is even if a person does feel guilty after action A, why on the basis of evolutionary naturalism should she avoid action A to avoid guilt feelings? What if the problem is not with action A, but rather with the feelings? Why avoid action A because I feel a certain way when action A might be most desirable? Another reason that Darwin uh, tells us that we have the moral sense and why it is that we're moral unlike the lower uh, animals is because we have a desire to be esteemed and that causes us as humans to experience guilt. So reflective capacity, we reflect on our actions and we begin to note a causal link between our feel, guilt, feelings of guilt and certain actions. And then we infer, I'll avoid particular actions so I don't feel these feelings anymore. Uh, well, another reason uh, that he says, we have a desire to be esteemed and that causes us to experience guilt. Now, Darwin writes, uh, the nature and strength of the feelings which we call regret, shame, repentance or remorse depend apparently not only on the strength of the violated instinct, but partly on the strength of the temptation and often still more on the judgment of our fellows. How far each man's values, how far each man values the appreciation of others depends on the strength of his innate or acquired feelings of sympathy. So responding to Darwin, Mark Linville uh, in, um, in uh, a great article, he helps us to get, and I think it's in Blackwell's Companion for Natural Theology, uh, where he addresses some of Darwin's thoughts. Uh, but Mark Linville says, according to Darwin's sense of guilt uh, in our experience, in natural experience of anyone who spurns the prompting of anyone of the more enduring social instincts, right? So according to Darwin, the sense of guilt is the natural experience of anyone who spurns the prompting of any of the more enduring social instincts. Uh, interesting thought. And so let me just offer kind of a critique between the link of looking for guilt and the esteem of others. First, while it may be uh, that humans desire to be esteemed by others, such a desire is less than an ideal motive for us to be moral in our behavior. Um, think about it. To eradicate guilt, a person has to either meet the standard by which she maintains a high approval rating, um, or she may conclude that the true solution is to dispel to dispelling guilt um, is to become socially indifferent to the opinions of others. So that is to say, the way to avoid guilt is to rid oneself of sympathy. Like the Buddhist who strives to quell all desire in order to avoid suffering, on this view, a person may cease to care what others think so as not to experience guilt. So if I experience guilt by recognizing that I am considered blameworthy by my moral community, well, why am I obligated to my moral community? And why do I care so much what my moral community thinks? So maybe I need to not care so much about being esteemed by others and chart my own moral course. Uh, you'll see some of this as it relates to Nietzsche when we talk about him next week on some of the stance that he'll take. Um, obviously, I would argue that that would be a drastic move to take, but it's certainly one option versus living for you know, the esteem of others. Let me find my place. A second problem with Darwin's uh, explanation that I'm looking at here for 
the second explanation of why it is that we're moral because we want to be esteemed by others. Um, a second problem with Darwin's second explanation of why we feel moral guilt is the observation that the motive for good action is not for the good actions in and of themselves, nor for the well-being of others. But the deeper motive is the desire to be esteemed. This seems self-serving. So if that's one of the reasons that we're moral, that is to be esteemed by others, are we motivated then so that we can be esteemed by others or so that we can avoid being looked at as blameworthy? Uh, why not be motivated for the good itself? Uh, why not be motivated uh, on more altruistic fashions versus just wanting to be looked at or perceived in an esteemed manner. A third problem with Darwin's second explanation of moral guilt is that it creates an entire host of morally naturalistic dilemmas for each individual living within eclectic cultures. For example, who is the person hoping to be esteemed by? Which group? Which person? Which culture within the culture? in morally hybrid cultures where values and customs are highly textured and nuanced. It would seem that the opportunity to experience guilt is unlimited, is vast. So let me think of a critique uh, as it relates to a diversified view of guilt and culture. First, if the moral sense is relative to one's culture, so too is moral guilt. If a person is only guilty when he or she violates a cultural norm, then guilt is relative to each culture, which then would mean that there is no such thing as objective moral guilt. Moral morality fluctuates based on each culture and its mores. And if each culture serves as the moral standard for what is right and what is wrong, then it seems that culture rather than biology offers the superior explanation to account for morality. So Darwin is wanting to offer up a naturalistic explanation using you know, biology, right? But it seems like it's more culturally um, informed morality versus trying to biologize uh, our ethics. It seems like we need to have a good in culturalization, a good in culturalization of it instead. Now, let me just give some final assessments of Darwin's naturalistic explanation of moral guilt. Now, keep in mind, uh, Darwin certainly is not somebody who is going to be Kantian, uh, you know, believing in a categorical imperative. He is going to recognize that morality is relative from culture to culture, but in wanting to offer up an explanation on naturalism, according to um, Darwinian evolution, uh, I think he has a hard time doing that. Uh, Darwin's explanation of moral guilt is heavily influenced by his own Victorian um, moral context. In fact, uh, as a theist, I don't uh, make this statement on my own. In fact, my insights into this have been formed uh, by uh, other atheists and agnostics like Michael Roos. Uh, his indictment of Darwin is, it is true that in the descent of man, Darwin makes moral judgments and prescriptions of an entirely conventional upper middle class Victorian ilk. Or consider... Uh, atheist philosopher Richard Joyce's uh, assessment of Darwin. He remains apparently confident in his own Victorian moral opinions, happily referring to the low morality of savages, calling slavery a great crime, and freely using words like noble, evil, and barbarous. It remains obscure why Darwin thinks that the human moral sense when shaped by the particular cultural trajectory of the British Empire, results in moral opinions uh, that that it results in moral opinions that humans living in large groups will eventually align upon. So there's just a few critiques uh, from those who would not be friendly to theism, but would recognize that Darwin uh, is blinded. In fact, you'll see when we talk about uh, Nietzsche. Uh, Nietzsche takes uh, 
Darwinian ethics, right? Or excuse me, Darwinian evolution to its uh, ethical conclusions by basically kicking out all foundations for morality. And obviously the father of uh, post-modernity, uh, philosophical father of post-modernity, we lose all structure, right? We're going to, uh, by will to power, define our own moral power. We need to uh, figure out a way to overcome because we do not have any sort of absolute morality. And he'll criticize the utilitarianism uh, uh, that was obviously influencing Darwin. Uh, but he'll, he'll criticize the utilitarians of uh, his day there in the 19th century. Um, now, setting aside all supernatural explanations for moral guilt on naturalism alone, um, Darwin was far from solving the moral enigma. In fact, among naturalists, there remains to this day widespread disagreement. So even removing supernatural explanations, uh, there's not a one-size-fits-all naturalistic explanation. Uh, for morality. Uh, I mean, you're going to have, uh, you know, there's not one size fits all type of uh, naturalists, uh, you know, you can be humanitarian naturalist, uh, you know, a nihilist. Um, there's lots of different flavors, right? A new atheist. Uh, there's different flavors. Um, Thomas Huxley, obviously, um, was in favor of evolution but as it relates to uh, morality, and he would write, cosmic evolution may teach us how the good and the evil tendencies of man may have come about. But in itself, it is incompetent to furnish any better reason why what we call good is preferable to what we call evil than what we had before. So natural selection as a mindless mechanism thinks nothing of right and wrong. Rather, it does not even think it's mindless it's purposeless and if we are the product of a of you know this mindless process this purposeless process and we're determined that way uh, why should we trust our faculties at all uh, michael roos and eo wilson uh, their famed declaration about morality or ethics as we understood it as an illusion fobbed off on us um, to, by our genes to get us cooperate, uh, that's a reasonable explanation on naturalism. Bruce went on to say, our moral sense, our altruistic nature is an adaptation, a feature helping us in the struggle for existence and reproduction, no less than hands and eyes, teeth and feet. It is a cost-effective way of getting us to cooperate, which avoids both the pitfalls of blind action, and the expense of the super brain of pure rationality. So as mentioned to this day, there exists no account on naturalism that satisfactorily explains the emergence of humanity's moral sense on naturalism. In fact, um, given biologist Jeff Lee Schloss, uh, who committed himself to a thorough review of the literature on F evolutionary theories of morality, he states, not only do we lack currently a fully adequate account of morality, but the manifold accounts that we do have are also disparate and are often represented by prominent exegetes as having resolved issues that are still in dispute. In personal correspondence with Schloss, uh, William Lane Craig cites some of the correspondence that you have Schloss further expressing that the evolutionary debunking argument assumes that moral beliefs are in fact adequately explained by natural selection. There is little question that they are not. Dispositions towards certain behaviors, reciprocity, parental care, do have fairly compelling evolutionary explanations, but we don't have a plausible evolutionary proposal for the moral beliefs associated with these behaviors. He says, I've done it a fairly recent review of the literature, and I can't find any coherent account for moral beliefs or even normative intuitions. Um, our executive producer, Tim Hole, I think he put together a PDF of the different um, quotes that I have where you can see the date and then you 
can go ahead and look at the books. Um, I just sent them the date, the author, the page number. And you can just plug that in and find all the other bibliographical data that you need to go and validate these sites. But Schloss's word uh, should cause anyone to pause next time a person hears someone claiming uh, that a widely accepted account is available, is, is available that demonstrates how natural selection explains our moral sense. That is not the case. Uh, you can have some who are objective realists, uh, like uh, Wheelingberg, uh, who would you give a platonic account. Uh, you'll have people like Sam Harris and his moral landscape, who will talk about objective morality. You'll have, um, you know, uh, th th there's, there's plenty of people out there. You think about the um, debate that William Lane Craig had, and I uh, don't recall her name right off the top of my head, uh, uh, but um, it's a great debate with a female atheist who recognizes that morals are objective. And then you'll have others who are going to reject uh, that there is such a thing as objective morality, like Michael Roos. Um, so that said, uh, Darwin's explanation for moral guilt is better explained through the lens of cultural evolution than it is through the lens of biological evolution. And I already um, hinted at that. Um, another point is in, by means of assessment is even if Darwin's assumption is valid that socially instinctive animals will develop a moral sense through increased intellectual capacity, that does not necessarily mean they will uh, sense moral guilt as a result of their immoral uh, behavior. So Darwin believes that it's highly probable, right? He writes that any animal, whatever, endowed with well-marked social instincts, the parental and fil uh, filial uh, affections being here included, would inevitably acquire a more a moral sense or conscience as soon as its intellectual powers have become as well or nearly as well developed as in man. So interesting statement by Darwin, right? We have reflective capacity um, as evolution continues to stay its course, as the lower animals continue to evolve in their reflective capacity, they too then will be able to develop a moral sense. But uh, evolutionary biologist and philosopher Francisco Ayala maintains that this is a hypothetical issue that uh, Darwin raises because no other animal has ever reached the level of human mental faculties, language included. And even when animals do exhibit um, moral qualities such as altruism, sympathy, uh, reciprocity, like Franz de Waal, for example, would want to showcase. This does not entail that the same animals are guilty of immoral behavior when they fail to act in the moral fashion comparable to that of human behavior. Rather, in Darwin's view, it appears that actions are only wrong when the intellect says so, right? Or the conscience. So is set in such a way to measure the moral worth of one's decisions. So really, what brings us to have the sense of ought is when we reflect. So then it's our intellect that, that is the moral law. It's our intellect using or coupled with our reflective capacity that forms a moral ought. But why should we trust an intellect that is uh, just so happens to evolve into uh, the intellect that it has? Uh, why should uh, we be morally obligated? To it, why should we trust that we're evolving uh, in the right direction? Rather, in Darwin's view, it appears that actions are only wrong when the intellect says so. Another uh, assessment is Darwin's explanations fail to answer the question of why we ought to feel guilty. And I touched on this in answering the question that he was wanting to answer: Why does man regret? Darwin never really answers the question, why ought we to do something or why ought we regret? Um, if there is no real ought, then no one ought to really regret. Uh, and if everything is determined, then there is no free will 
And if there is no free will, then there is no real guilt by which one could truly be culpable. It's like Bruce said, an illusion. Uh, Linville adds, what, what Darwin never asks and thus never answers is why man ought, in fact, to obey the one rather than the other. The best that he offers here is the observation that if instinct A is stronger than instinct B, then one will obey A. What he does not, and I suggest cannot say, is that one ought to obey A, or that one ought to feel the force of A over B. So in Darwin's view, instinct or impulse uh, is the neo ought, uh, or reflection leads us to arriving at what we ought to do. This, review, this reduces the metaphysical sense of ought down to an emotional urge. In Darwin's view, urge is the new ought. Uh, this, urge is, uh, this urge is impulse or instinct, but within a metaphysical framework, uh, ought and urge fail to make good sim siblings. Uh, ought is I have to, whereas urge is I want to. So on final analysis, Darwin's explanation for moral guilt fails to answer with any moral force the question of why we ought to regret, why we ought to feel guilty. Absent of a metaphysical grounding for morality, one is left on the basis of natural history to conclude that morality minus God equals guilt minus objectivity. So while Darwin may feel guilt upon reflection, it is no guarantee uh, that I will. And uh, herein lies the problem. So uh, th as I have reflected on Darwin a little bit here, uh, that's where I'm at now. I'm open to uh, looking at some things differently. I would not describe myself as a Darwinian, uh, Nietzschean, a Freudian scholar. I'm simply isolating uh, my studies, answer the question that I'm interested in, and that is what is each of these individuals' naturalistic explanation of guilt. And I've isolated certain texts that I will look at, and it is Darwin's Descent of Man, uh, where you can look in chapter four and chapter five and get some helpful insight. There's some other stuff that he speaks about as it relates to guilt elsewhere. Um, and, and there's things that I share in my footnote that in my footnotes that I heavily document uh, for my um, upcoming research that I hope to have published on uh, guilt. But that's where I'm at right now. And so basically what I've said thus far is Darwin set out in Descent of Man to take his theory that he laid down in Origin of the Species in 1859 to provide a naturalistic account that he thought was the first one in history to do so, to provide a, an account of how it is that we have this moral sense, and in particular, moral guilt, and why it is that we have this sense of oughtness, and why we have a sense of regret. And I shared that he uses some of these terms synonymously, like regret, remorse, misery, misery dissatisfaction, guilt. And I shared that uh, that he never really gets to the answer of why we ought to experience guilt. And I shared that his explanation uh, he has some good cultural explanations, but it's not good biological explanations. So we have relativism, which you would concede amongst the different cultures, but it, it doesn't seem as if it's biology really doing the explaining as much as him being influenced by the utilitarianism of the day that he lived in. And he failed to see that he was bringing his own moral bias to the table. And hey, I don't fault him for that. We all have that. But in the end, I think that uh, he was not able to set out to achieve the goal that he set 
to provide a good biological explanation of why it is that we are moral outside of being able to say we're reflective beings uh, that doesn't tell us too much we are reflective but it doesn't still answer just because i can reflect why should i be moral why should i trust my, my reflections how do i ground this well if we ground it in reason and reflection uh, it's subjective so with that I'm going to check out and see what we've got uh, going on in the comments and see what developed over the hour. Um, <clears throat> hey, Bobby, thanks for the quick answer on pastor, pastor's perspective there at the end. I would love that in-depth answer sometime. Ah, Elijah. Yes, Elijah was asking uh, on the radio program a little bit ago, if my memory serves me correctly, at what point do you start? you know, teaching people some in-depth theology uh, once they're saved. And I think it's really important that once a person uh, does get saved, that we help them to understand the big picture worldview, but we tell them to take their time in understanding the different views. So if somebody gets saved, they become part of a church, we want them to understand, yes, that God is creator, that Jesus died on the cross, uh, you know, that Christ is coming again, but we don't, we don't have to get them to buy into young earth or old earth or pre-trib or post-trib or mid-trib or, uh, you know, uh, any of these types of theories right off the bat. We want them to understand uh, that, you know what, God's the creator. Christ is coming again. We want them to understand the big picture stuff uh, and we want them to take their time learning these different views because if they commit to views prematurely, then they might find themselves in a crisis of faith when somebody knocks down the position that they thought they had so firmly in place later. Uh, so uh, feel free to call up again tomorrow because I'm not exactly sure the level of depth that you want to go there, uh, but uh, we can talk about it on the radio tomorrow. Um, thank you for th those of you telling us where you're from. Love seeing people from. Uh, Kenneth in Florida, Elizabeth in Ohio. Uh, we've got Jeff from Alaska. Um, one person writes, theological interpretation is not simply what dogmatic theologians do when they use the Bible to support their respective doctrinal positions. Uh, good point. Um, going through, um, a Catholic friend of mine is scared uh, crapless of going to purgatory. False guilt was my response. Uh, yeah, well, I would say false theology, right? Uh, in the scriptures, there's no place in the scriptures where we see purgatory. Um, uh, though that is a Catholic teaching, uh, purgatory from the word purge, implying that, uh, you know, after, uh, death post mortem, uh, we have this opportunity to experience, sort of a softening of the heart in order to recognize the gospel where uh, we sort of purged, uh, you know, have atonement for our own sins. Uh, Christ paid for all of our sins on the cross. Uh, and uh, when we recognize that, uh, he is the, our Savior, pays for our sins on our behalf. He's the one who takes away our guilt. And it, it's through him that we um, uh, enter eternity with him. And so I would say uh, that it's important that we don't uh, embrace purgatory as a view. Uh, guilt, uh, somebody writes, is an emotional response. Uh, it, is an, it, is, it is an emotional response, but it doesn't mean uh, guilt is not objective. I would state that if, um, if the moral law says um, don't murder and I go and murder somebody um, and then I feel guilty, my, my guilt is objective insofar as it corresponds to breaking the moral law that I shouldn't murder. So if I feel guilty for murder and I didn't murder, then my guilt is not objective. But if I murdered somebody and I feel guilty for it, then my guilt is corresponding to reality and therefore it's objective. That's the same thing with all of our emotions. All of our emotions are not um, objective, right? If somebody is sexually aroused, right, let's say, uh, that's not subjective uh, if indeed they are sexually aroused. And there's a corresponding, uh, you know, in my case, my wife is there, right? Uh, if somebody is, uh, if somebody 
is about to rob a bank and they go through with it and they feel guilty for stealing. Uh, those That guilt corresponds to not stealing. So it's objective. Um, if I feel fear that somebody's chasing me with an ax, but nobody's chasing me with an ax, then my feeling is subjective. But if somebody is chasing me with an ax and I say, oh, my feelings aren't objective, well, then I might just get my head chopped off. So ideally, um, we want our emotions to correspond to reality. Uh, Lopez Media Ministries, God bless you, Dr. Conway. Hey, thank you so much. Uh, Darwin was an atheist. Nietzsche and Freud uh, were agnostics. This is uh, Film Bay. Um, well, uh, you know, there is lots of discussion that comes up that you'll hear on this. Um, uh, and we can get into Darwin's uh, viewpoint and Freud's viewpoint in the upcoming weeks um, as it relates to where they stand. Uh, but they certainly did not operate uh, as if there was any explain any uh, any hope of god existing or god's existing um you know the death of god right pronouncement comes with nietzsche um that's not to say that god was existing and now he no longer exists but the god is as a useful fiction no longer is needed um i'm moving through here um do we have any questions? Um, Callum, I have some friends who have difficulty understanding taboo topics like homosexuality. Can you please give your best reasonable and emotional suggestions to solve this? Well, I mean, the topic of homosexuality, uh, the LGBTQ, it's a, it, it's, it's a tough conversation because it's become sort of the ultimate conversation in our culture. And if we do not celebrate it, if we do not wear rainbow uh, colors, if we do not um, fall in line, then it means that we're bigoted. But it, uh, it, it's, it's illogical for us to, to believe that, right? In the same way, I believe it's very possible for us to accept each other, even if we don't agree with each other. That's the true tolerance that we should be after. Um, we have a culture that uh, is so passionate about being tolerant, being tolerant, being tolerant, but it's a misunderstanding of tolerance. True tolerance means that we love and accept each other, even if we don't agree with one another. And so I think that we have to be able to get the narrative out there that, um, we shouldn't be forcing each other to agree with one another in order to make a statement that we accept each other uh, in the same way that we could disagree with homosexuality. We can bring up um, the whole, we can bring up the, the phrase with somebody, um, you know, you, so you, re, you, you don't accept me because I, I believe this about the Bible. Uh, so you mean I have to, forfeit my convictions in order to be accepted and loved by you don't shouldn't we have a deeper view of love one that uh, is built on we love each other because uh you know we care about each other as humans and we can tolerate each other even if we don't agree with each other and i think that's really important try to stress to people that you don't hate them uh people that that and and you know we need to get people to be, let's be honest about the narrative. When Christians don't agree with LGBTQ, that has nothing to do with them saying that they don't love people who are part of the LGBTQ. It might be for some, but I would stand with the LGBTQ movement in a moment and say, "Hey, we love you." And if these Christians are out there carrying around banners saying that God hates you, they're wrong. Uh, but I would say. We should be able to align uh, uh, on, on a common language, and the language is this, um, that one group believes LGBTQ is wrong. Another group Christians might say, or, or, or it's right. The other group Christians might say it's wrong, but it doesn't mean we have to hate each other and demonize each other. It means that we can still love each other and accept each other and have true tolerance of letting people you know, form their own thoughts and form their own opinions. So I hope that that helps a little bit. Um, let's see. Don't get too excited. Uh, let's see. Um, someone came in with a, uh, don't get too excited, not U.S. cash in Philippine pesos. Uh, but, hey, thank you for this gift uh, for sure. Uh, 
it says the usual comment I see uh, for that morals is that what is good for human flourishing has evolved for morality. Is your response similar to William Lane Craig to the claim who says human flourishing is a good thing? Well, human flourishing is a good uh, thing. Uh, but to get at the question, the usual comment I see for that is that morals is good for human flourishing has evolved for morality. I'm trying to understand the question because of some of the uh, way that it's reading here. Uh, sometimes it's tough. I know we're in different language contexts and stuff, so I'm having a hard time. Let me read it again. The usual comment I see for Nat uh, morals is that what is good for human flourishing is evolved for morality. Um, according to... Uh, you know, a lot of evolutionists, they would believe that human flourishing is kind of the purpose of morality is that we flourish so that we can, you know, continue on survival of the fittest. And if, if, and we need morality to flourish. We need morality so that uh, we can, you know, carry on our genes to our descendants and so on and so forth. So, yes, um, I would say that human flourishing is a good thing, uh, but. I would want to ground the moral, the morals by which we believe that humans flourish in, um, in the nature of God. So thank you so much uh, for your generous gift. That means a ton. And uh, we're thankful to anybody. Uh, join us here at One Minute Apologists. We're looking for Patreon supporters. Uh, we're looking uh, you can get, uh, you can learn more about that by just checking out the links that Tim's putting up. Um, you also, uh, we'd love for you to follow us on Facebook, uh, follow us on Instagram, um, like us, subscribe, share. That would be huge. Um, let's see here. I'm going through and reading Tim, uh, on the other side. I, I don't know all the comments that have come in, so. I don't know if I'm just reading statements, if we're coming down to the end here. Um, let's see. Uh, Film Bay put Darwin and his theories are directly responsible for the atrocities of the 20th century. Uh, Stalin, Hitler, Mao, Pol Pot, etc. cetera. Uh, he was an atheist with no morals. Um, you know, this is one of the, the elements where you do see a lot of this conversation uh, comes up, right? But I, I, I would say taking uh, in William Lane Craig uh, in debating a Hitchens or uh, you, you would see him bring this up or John Lennox that what we're getting at here is yes, if you take um, the morals, which basically, you know, with no foundation for morality, uh, we've seen some of the dangers that have ha been posed to culture that have been influenced uh, by sort of a survival of the fittest. Let's kill off all of those <coughs> in the name of eugenics that aren't going to help human flourishing because they're going to pollute the gene pool. Um, while, while we could say that, uh, I think it's really important as well, though, for us to not be biased to realize that, you know, Christians have done some stupid things too. Now, I know that lots of arguments come up about, uh, you know, a lot of times Christians will counter and say, you know, or a lot of times atheists will counter and talk about the Salem witch trials, the Crusades, the Spanish Inquisition, and so on and so forth. For that, I would really encourage people to read Bearing False Witness by Rodney Stark, who's a great uh, historian. And he really, you know, brings down some of the hype of the exaggerations about the atrocities committed in the name of Christ by the church. Nevertheless, uh, I recognize that uh, Christians have been jacked up. I'm jacked up. I don't have it all together. Uh, and it's not our life that ultimately gives the defense of Christianity. It's the life of Christ. Though our life is important, Jesus says, the world will know you're my disciples uh, if you love one another. And sadly, that's not always the case. Um, so I would say that, uh, for the Stalins and Hitlers and Pol Pots that we can point out, uh, sadly, it won't take long for atheists to point out Christians who weren't living in alignment either. Uh, Gandhi saying, you know, hey, I would, I love your Jesus. It's just your, your 
Christians I don't love. I think that's fair. So for me, um, that doesn't have to be something of the argument there because we're sort of just attacking the people. And I think that given uh, naturalism, this is what I love so much about David Baggett and um, uh, and Wall's book, uh, Good God and God and Cosmos, on the, the abductive argumentation flow uh, for the moral argument, because instead of starting with the a-theological premise, premise one of the deductive argument, for example, that William Lane Craig uses, whom I absolutely revere and love as a human being and as a philosopher and scholar uh, and have learned so much from him. I love some of the uh, thoughts that Baggett uh, and Walls offer as it relates to not starting with a deductive a theological premise, which would say, you know, if objective moral values and duties do not exist, then God does not exist. Because that gets the conversation off uh, perhaps in an incendiary fashion. Uh, and so what Baggett and Walls want to do and what I do, taking uh, what I've learned from them and their books, is an abductive approach in the beginning of my research as well and saying, okay, given naturalism and the rich resources that I would say as a theist that God created this world, it shouldn't surprise us, Baggett and Walls would say, that naturalists could come up with some form of argumentation of why it is that there's morals. The difference is, is they just won't give credit to God for that, right? And we will be able to give an account for it. But I think that we have a more fertile ground of relational building uh, when we don't start with the all theological premise. Uh, and when we don't start with statements like Darwin and his theories of directly responsible for those atrocities in the 20th century, which I would agree with Film Bay uh, wholeheartedly that given uh, the atrocities that took place, it doesn't take long to see what happened there. Uh, but perhaps as a perspective on how we can talk in a way where we can have conversations with one that might help. Um, I'm continuing down uh, down to read a bit here. Darwin cared more about animals than people. Uh, well, he spent a lot of time uh, looking at them. God bless you, Film Bay says. Hey, thank you, Film Bay. I really appreciate that and your interaction. Um, David Wood. <laughs> David Wood at Act 17 Apologetics. What's Darwin's explanation of Bobby's hair? Seems like nat natural selection would eliminate it. Does Bobby's hair defeat Darwin? Oh, that's my good friend there. So you can always uh, count on him to chime in. He gives me a hard time every week. So thank you, D Wood, for that. Uh, <laughs> when you come out and see me in uh, April, bro, I'm going to give you a, a B Conway hookup. I'm going to buzz the heck out of your do. I'm going to cut a line and do it for you, baby. How about that? All right. Um, Callum says, it is also strange how skeptics glorify natural select and for at selection for adding information when in reality it takes away information in each generation. Well, there is, we are mutating to death, uh, no doubt about that. Um, John, um, uh, what was his name? John Sanford talks about genetic entropy. And uh, boy, uh, we are definitely uh, mutating to death. And uh, that's what's happening in the genetic pool for sure. Um, let's see here if there's anything else I can talk about. Um, 6640, hello from the Philippines. I've been watching your videos for the last five years and have been so encouraged by your recent open openness about your alcoholism. Hey, thank you so much for, uh, out there in the Philippines, 6640. Uh, I it means a ton, and I hope to be able to talk more. Have my bride on, Heather, with me yesterday. It was much more pragmatic than today where we talked about marriage. It's one of the things I I think maybe just with my passion uh, for the church. I was a pastor for so many years, uh, uh, and then I love apologetics and philosophy. I find myself wanting to talk about topics that hit the head, hit the heart, hit the hands, you know, social justice issues. So, um we're going to be balancing all that stuff out. Really have a heart to help married couples and and addicts and alcoholics. Alcoholism, it can be so vicious and um, so challenging. And so uh, love, love, love hearing uh, that you've been encouraged by that and help us get that out. So 
appreciate you and your shout out. Um, let's see here. Jimmy. Hey, yes. How about everyone donate? We'd love it. A little bit goes a long way. Hey, I'm telling you, uh, people, uh, I, I don't like talking about funds. I really don't. But in all seriousness, uh, we do have a real need. Uh, and uh, we're not trying to do, you know, the whole health and wealth thing. Uh, but we do have a real need to, to fund this ministry. I've got Tim on the other side myself. And uh, we want to keep coming to you. We want to keep providing all these videos. And we have so many fun projects. And so uh, please do consider us uh, jumping on a, as a Patreon supporter just by hitting on the link. And uh, we'd love that. Um, let's see here. Um, I don't understand why anyone would buy into a worldview with no hope, no moral standard, no sense, and no proof, uh, Callum puts. You know, uh, for some atheists, uh, they become kind of, uh, you, you, you will have some, you have like the existentialists, uh, like Soren Kierkegaard, who was the Dutch, ex ex Dutch Danish existentialist. And he would find himself um, living in his Danish culture. And he really struggled with kind of the creedal Christianity of his day. And so he really kind of just, but, but he still totally believed in Christ, but, you know, he talks about this existential leap of faith, so to speak, of believing and believing in Christ. But what he saw taking place in his culture uh, was horrifying to him, kind of a Christianity that atheists could use against Christians in argumentation. And we would just have to say, hey, what was taking place there in the Danish world of Kierkegaard? was horrific. Uh, but then when you think about like a Jean-Paul Sartre, uh, you know, um, existence precedes um, being. Uh, and uh, as another kind of atheistic existentialist, that is our existence that we have, we have to form our own being. Our existence um, is nothing. And so we have to ascribe meaning to it. And, we have to create purpose in our own life. And so um, that's what you'll have people doing uh, when it comes, like if you think about um, um, uh, don't you just love that? One of those brain deals, um, Albert Camus. Uh, I've read some of his novels and stuff. Uh, you know, life is pitiless. It's empty. It, there's nothing there. Right. Um, but you have to kind of realize if you're putting on their worldview glasses, that some particular atheists, not all, some would say uh, that life really is empty. You just totally nihilistic and you might as well just commit suicide and just end your whole life. Right. Some would say, yes, life does look that way, but um, we have to kind of ascribe meaning to it. We have to make the most of it. And so you'll have kind of your more humanitarian atheists and they'll say, Hey, you know what? That's what it is. Life just stinks, you know, right? You die. So let's make the most of it. Let's realize that you can have a good life. And, uh, for me, I'm with you, Callum. I don't think that that, uh, nearly is, is enriching. Uh, than the worldview that we ascribe to as Christians. And the atheists would say, well, you shouldn't just ascribe to a worldview because it's seemingly more enriching. Well, I would say building out a cumulative case for the existence of God, I would think that um, that the whole vision of Christianity, when we look at a cumulative case, argues much stronger than naturalism. Hey, we, you know, naturalists will say things like, you know, I can't believe in a, in a God uh, of Christianity. I mean, why would a good God, uh, how could a good God allow so much suffering in the world? If God's good, why isn't he showing up and answering the prayers of those who are in the midst of tragedy? I'd say, well, if I walk out of atheism, well, then I inherit no ultimate justice. Whereas in theism, I might not have God always responding to me as quickly, coming to my rescue as quickly, but we have ultimate justice. So on atheism, Pol Pot, Mussolini, Hitler, Mao Zedong, characters of the likes, uh, there is no ultimate justice. So um, that would be something that I would share. Um, let me see here. I'm kind of reading through here. <clears throat> 
that looks like um, we got a lot of interaction going on, so appreciate that. Tim, I'm going to jump on and see if you added anything for me to talk about. Um, is objective morality explainable by what has been good for human flourishing? William Lane Craig responds by who says human? Yes. Okay. I, I Thank you, Tim, for clarifying that for me. Yeah. Is objective morality explainable by what has been good for human flourishing? And Craig responds by saying, who says human flourishing is a good thing, right? Uh, and uh, Tim writes, I think that uh, Sam Harris says that. And I think you're right, Tim, in his book, The Moral Landscape. Like, why is moral why is moral or, or why is human flourishing kind of the the categorical imperative of uh, uh, of naturalism? Uh, why 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 does that? Because it you know what, what what's the reason there? Um, and then who gets to define what human flourishing is? Uh, so you're just going to end up in relativism as well. So all that to say, hey, thank you everybody for jumping on. Uh, I know that uh, for some people, this would be an incredibly boring uh, kind of a discussion. So for those of you that are married to a spouse that does not enjoy philosophy, uh, go ahead and play this for them tonight and as their bedtime story. And I'm sure that they'll sleep good. Uh, for those of you that enjoy just geeking out a little bit, I sure appreciate you jumping on. This is helpful for me just to get to talk about uh, my research as well. So uh, this is week two. As I'm walking through, uh, looking at naturalistic explanations in pursuit of what best accounts, what best accounts for guilt is it, namely uh, naturalism or theism? Uh, before I jump off, there's a final question. It looks like it came in. Why is what God wants the categorical imperative? See, and that's a good question too, uh, Valdrex. Uh, I would agree that we have to ask that. We can flip it. And that's where you end up with a lot of this stuff. We can just constantly go back and forth and go back and forth. And that's why we're looking at a cumulative case. Now, the categorical imperative, Immanuel Kant, he rejected most arguments for the existence of God. Uh, you did have others like Harris, Aristotle or Aquinas and some others uh, dabbling with kind of morality. But the first person to put forth a full-on case of morality uh, was Immanuel Kant, and he argued not hypothetically, but practically uh, for the argument for the existence of God. For Immanuel Kant, um, he argued that uh, you had to postulate God's existence uh, as a necessity to fit uh, this tension that we sense between ought and can, right? Like, like we, we, we had this sense of that we ought to fulfill this moral law, but we, but can we do it? And it's going to take time, eternity, and God for that to happen. So unless God exists, he argues from pure practical reason, uh, then we will never be able to fulfill this moral law that we sense upon us. So it will require God, time, eternity for us to do what we ought to do. And uh, as it relates to the categorical imperative, it's formulated in several different ways, but kind of the universal one that often talked about or one of the popular renditions of it is act in such a way so as you could deem this to be sort of the everybody's obligation. So you reason um, before you do an action, is this categorical? Um, is it universal? Uh, in that what I'm wanting to do, can I uh, say that this is something that everybody, given the same reflective processes, should go through and deem that this should be superimposed categorically on humanity to get at this imperative? And um, I think that that's a tricky one as well. I don't think you can, uh, I don't think you could always, you know, come tightly tight down on everything as well. I think that there's some stuff to learn there. I think that's a good process for us to go through. Like when it comes to a moral decision, um, could I superimpose this on everybody? But the utilitarian in the same way, they'll look at it differently though. They'll say, um, let's do what's best 
for the most amount of happiness. Well, let's do what will produce the most amount of happiness for people. Well, you can't, you can't do the math on that. You can only speculate. Um, and you can speculate wrongly. In the same way with the categorical imperative, um, you might have this decision that you think everybody should do. Uh, but we have to think about we are maybe not capable of processing the particular moral fact that we're thinking about through the lens of everybody else's moral experience and moral understanding. Um, but at the same token, I, I think it's more of a cumulative case. And we put all things together. I just think theism better explains morality uh, than non-theism, uh, though I definitely can concede questions uh, that need to be asked. And I think that that's uh, more genuine for us. And I think, uh, I think atheists should recognize that they need to concede things. And uh, we just need to quit beating each other up and just have some honest conversations. And maybe it'd be cool to see atheists and theists building friendships and showing each other that they can accept each other, love each other, be kind to each other, even though they don't agree with each other. And then hopefully they can become intellectually informed by one another. And then, yes, obviously as Christians, we would want uh, people to believe in Christianity because why? We believe Christ is the Savior, rose from the grave. And uh, we believe that there's good evidence for the historicity of the resurrection of Christ. Well, I think with that, we'll close. But hey, join us again and uh, peace out.